FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's June 18th, 2018. Well, been watching North Korea, watching Trump. Lots of interesting things happening there. Is it smoke and mirrors? Is it real? Well, before we get to that, as always, join the show. Email us. Again, the email address is kl at kerrylutz.com. So we're looking at what's happening in Asia what's happening with China, what their intentions are. And the person you're about to hear from, Stephen Mosier, is author of a really interesting book that kind of, uh, kind of explains a lot called The Bully of Asia. Uh, Stephen, you've been uh, covering China literally on the ground since 1979. So you're somebody who knows what's, what you're talking about. And you believe that Trump may end the longest running war in American history, despite the efforts of China to sabotage the talks. So first, welcome back again. And we're really happy to have you back on. Well, it's, it's good to be here. I have been following China and Asia for a long time. I was an officer in the Seventh Fleet back in the 1970s, resigned my commission, went to the Chinese University of Hong Kong, learned to speak, read and write Chinese and was the first American in China uh, back in 1979, written a dozen books on the country, and of course have been following uh, the uh, shenanigans of, uh, of North Korea for the last few years. Um, and of course, if you, if you talk about North Korea, you've got to talk about China because uh, North Korea's lifeline uh, is China. North Korea's defender, North Korea's only ally is the People's Republic of China. So you can't talk about North Korea without uh, mentioning Big Brother China. Well, so the fact is that North Korea has been a Chinese protectorate for centuries. And of course, anything that happens in North Korea is at the sufferance or desire of China. Isn't, isn't that true? Uh, China has an enormous amount of influence over North Korea. And in fact, this goes back, uh, this goes back 1,500 years. North Korea... Uh, Korea itself, in fact, was part of China, ruled directly from the Chinese capital uh, during several periods in Chinese history. And at other times, uh, as now, it has been a vassal state, a uh, tributary state of China. And, uh, you know, 90 percent of uh, North Korea's trade even today is with China. So if you want to uh, bring North Korea to the negotiating table by imposing sanctions on North Korea to have to shut down the North Korean economy and to cause pain to the leadership, uh, Kim Jong-un and the elite in Pyongyang. Uh, the road to do that leads through Beijing. So uh, yeah, uh, Beijing is key to uh, any discussion of, uh, of North Korea. So what happened here to enable Trump to have this apparently diplomatic victory <laughs> In the face of Chinese opposition, is North Korea, is uh, Kim Jong-un asserting himself or did they say, OK, did the U.S. promise China something? What's what's in it here? What's the real story? Well, here's 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 how um, uh, President Donald J. Trump denuked uh, North Korea in three easy moves. I, I think we're on the way to denuclearization. I now. agree. Uh, I really do. And and he did it in, uh, in in three easy moves. He first first he got Kim Jong Un's attention. Uh, second, he put him in a sanctions box, a penalty box, and for the first time imposed real sanctions on the North Korean regime. And third, in a uh, in a meeting in Singapore, the summit, uh, that was a principles only meeting between Kim Jong Un and Donald Trump. And they cut the spoiler, uh, two spoilers. In fact, they cut Russia and China out of the picture. And so it was, uh, it was Kim and Trump one-on-one -on -one and, uh, and I think, um, and, and Trump, uh, Trump won. Remember back in uh, last year, we had a war of words going on between Trump and mm -hmm. Kim. And a lot of people were a little upset about that because, uh, uh, it, president Trump was, was, was being, they said, unpresidential. He was being undiplomatic. He was, 
he was calling Kim Jong Un little rocket man and and saying that he yeah. would uh, visit fire and fury on North Korea if they continue to threaten the United States. Uh, but I believe that uh, that that blunt talk was exactly what uh, little rocket man needed to hear. Remember. This guy is a princeling, right, of a hereditary dynasty founded by his grandfather, Kim Mm Il-sung. And the princeling, Kim Jong-un, was coddled and cosseted and babied from birth. He was fawned over by everybody he met. He was elevated, of course, upon the death of his father, uh, Kim Jong-il. And he's since been treated. He's treated in North Korea as a virtual deity. In fact, the state-controlled press actually refers to him as a great person born of heaven. <laughs> a great person born of heaven. Now, that's pretty heady stuff for a 34-year-old dictator, right? To be told that you are heaven sent. You are you are, oh, you are a gift from, from God, from heaven. Yeah. yeah. Well, if we got gifts like that, but, you know, the guy's been a bad actor for quite some time. It looks like it it really fed into Chinese ambitions and wishes. And somehow he just seems to have outlived his usefulness. Is that what's happened? Well, what happened was that Kim got the message. Uh, and of course, that message was driven home by the side of uh, three carrier battle groups and maneuvers off the North Korean coast. And um, so I think that, that Trump's tough talk was uh, succeeded in, in concentrating Kim's mind. And the second thing that Trump did was he walled off North Korea from world trade. Last November, he declared the regime to be a state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, A month later, he convinced the UN Security Council to impose sanctions on Pyongyang. But more importantly than that, that that was actually the easy part. The hard part was getting China to abide by the sanctions regime. And and, and I don't, uh, people should recall that, uh, that Trump had to repeatedly call out Xi Jinping on Twitter as he as he does, um, because once the sanctions were in place, the uh, the traffic across the North Korean border with China actually began to pick up. And Trump said uh, trade between China and North Korea grew almost 40 uh, percent last year in the first quarter. So so much for China working with us, he said we had to give it a try. And then later on in the year, we actually caught Chinese ships uh, doing at sea fuel transfers and good transfers with North mm-hmm. Korean vessels. So they were trying to evade the sanctions machine by m- regime by carrying out their, their secret resupply of North Korea uh, by sea. They'd failed it by land and now, now they were trying it by sea. And he caught them again and he called them out on it. Uh, so by, um, by the end of the year, China had finally been embarrassed enough to actually stop with the secret support of the North Korean regime, as far as we're able to tell. So mm-hmm. what, what he'd done is he'd put North Korea in a box. So I think that he convinced uh, the North Korean dictator that he was uh, thinking about a military strike. Uh, he, was, he had put China helplessly on the sidelines, and, and that led Kim Jong-un to agree to talk about giving up his nuclear weapons. So we had the Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, go to Pyongyang, uh, the trip that paved the way for last week's Singapore summit. And, and, and the other thing he did finally at the summit, step three, was uh, it, he met one-on-one with Kim Jong-un, and he took his measure, and he clinched the deal. It took him about an hour in that one-on-one meeting, which is kind of amazing given that the, uh, there had been what we call six-party talks going on with for North years. Korea for over a decade. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had China at the table, Russia at the table, Japan, South Korea, so many people sitting around the table that nothing got done. You know, I mean, the larger the committee, uh, the the, the smaller the the amount of work that actually gets done. So I think the the combination of the tough talk and the Mm -hmm. tough sanctions and uh, Trump's gut instinct, uh, you know, in a one on one uh, situation was able to bring Trump, uh, uh, Kim Jong Un to the point where uh, he's going to give up his nukes. Um, you know, I mean, what what do you want to call that? Uh, you can call it Bronx diplomacy. Well, uh, but it worked. Yeah, maybe. it brought uh, Kim Jong Un to heel, where where diplomatic niceties for decades had done nothing but give him more time to build more nukes and more missiles. So, what about the criticism uh, from both people within his party? within the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. Oh, you gave up war games before you got anything out of them. This is terrible. How could you do such a thing? 
Well, I, I, I'm, I'm a little nervous about putting uh, the, the joint military exercises between uh, South Korean and, and American military troops uh, on hold for very long because, look, the, we're rotating troops in and out of South Korea now. Uh, they they go there for nine months. It's an unaccompanied tour, and and those troops that are arriving need to be in joint exercises so you can guarantee interoperability in the event of a crisis. On the other hand, it's not true to say that we didn't get anything uh, from North Korea. We got three hostages back at the very beginning of this. Uh, we got Kim Jong Un out of his comfort zone uh, into Singapore in a one on one meeting with uh, with uh, Donald Trump out. Uh, out of the sight and out of uh, the monitoring capability of, of the Chinese. They didn't like being sidelined, but they were. Uh, we're now getting the remains of soldiers who were killed, missing in action since the Korean War uh, ended in 1953. Um, we're getting, uh, we're in talks now about sending American nuclear inspection teams uh, to North Korea to their to the sites that need to be inspected. So it's it's not true to say that we're not getting getting anything out of this. And in the meantime, look, in the meantime, uh, nothing else happens unless and until Kim denuclearizes. The sanctions stay in place. The North Korean economy, what there is left of it, gradually grinds to a halt. And and we carefully watch the North Koreans and the Chinese for any signs of cheating. And if there is, then then the deal's off. I, you know, no one has any doubt, at least for Kim Jong Un, that President Trump will walk away from this deal if 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 it appears that uh, he or the Chinese are cheating. So I think the uh, the uh, temporary uh, halt in in military exercises is a reasonable thing to to engage in, um, as long as pressure is kept on in other areas, and it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it certainly appears to be. And certainly seems like a lot of the uh, a lot of the complaints by the parties involved are really just sour grapes. Well, if you if you think about it, uh, we had the failed effort by by President Clinton, uh, which involved giving uh, North Korea billions of dollars uh, in the late 90s in exchange for stopping their nuclear weapons program. Uh, that just bought them time. Uh, time which they used to advance their weapons program. And then again, we had the six party talks beginning in 2003, which ran on for six, seven years and achieved nothing but, but buying more time for these endless negotiations produced no, no results other than buying time for North Korea to build and test more nukes and missiles. So um, that's uh, both Republican and, and uh, previous Republican and, and Democrat administrations have failed to solve this problem. And the fact that, that, that President Trump is, is, is in the process of solving it, and I believe will solve it, uh, is galling to them because it shows up their efforts uh, as, as bootless. I mean, they went about it the wrong way. They tried to give goodies to North Korea to get them to stop engaging in, in uh, these threatening missile and nuke programs. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't bribe thugs into good behavior. Every parent alive knows that you don't reward bad behavior because if you reward bad behavior in a child, you get yeah, more of it. Yeah. You punish bad behavior. And that's what Trump did in a very commonsensical way. He punished bad behavior on the part of North Korea, and he's going to continue punishing them until they stop the bad behavior. Yeah, very true. Well, like, like I said, uh, you know, they tried... <laughs> Clinton tried bribing the North Koreans into submission, and it's ridiculous. Uh, just his strategy could never work. I mean, we have a lot of history with them going back to even after the armistice with North Korea, numerous incursions into the South, attacks, mortar, uh, artillery attacks across the DMZ, the seizing of the Pueblo, I think they took the Mayaquez at one point, too, and Jerry Ford bombed them and they gave it back. So we've got a lot of history with them of attacking American interests in the area. So there was really no other way to deal with these guys, was there? No, and remember that, that, that there have been attacks in, in, in more recent years as well. The the South Korean uh, naval vessel, the Chungnam, was, uh, was uh, torpedoed uh, back in 2010. Uh, it had 109 sailors on board, and many of them lost their lives. That was an unprovoked attack from North Korea. 
uh, probably a torpedo filed by a mini submarine. There was also a uh, artillery bombardment that was suddenly launched uh, by the North Koreans on a South Korean held island, which caused uh, a number of deaths. So there have been these incidents repeatedly over the years. Uh, an armistice is not a peace treaty. You know, we're we're still formally at war with South Korea, and so in that sense. Uh, these sanctions are um, are more than justified, not just by the fact that uh, of the development of nuclear weapons and missiles. I know that's what we're looking at at the present moment, but we are still 65 later, uh, later technically in a state of war with uh, North Korea, and we shouldn't be giving them anything, and our allies around the world shouldn't be trading with this rogue regime. And now, for the most part, they're not. And that's a good thing. And just looking at the situation also, uh, the South Koreans have just requested that the North Koreans pull back their heavy artillery from the DMZ. Mm-hmm. They're going to do it, aren't mm-hmm. they? Because they wouldn't have announced it if they didn't already know they were going to do it in all likelihood. Yeah, and the North Korean army has more artillery pieces than any other army in the world. It certainly has more artillery pieces than the U.S. Army has. And those are all stationed just north of the DMZ, and uh, many of them are aimed at Seoul, the northern suburbs of Seoul. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I visited, uh, are only about 15 miles south of the uh, of the DMZ, well within artillery range. Yeah. Um, and the DMZ itself is three miles wide, completely uh, denuded of any vegetation. It's just open country yeah. to make it easy for the North Koreans to shoot any defectors who try to escape from the north end of the south. Yeah, that's correct. Very true. So you think they'll comply with it? Uh, they'll think you think they'll honor the request. Well, I think I think that one of the things that's going to happen uh, with uh, in, in the in the weeks and months to come, and it won't happen overnight because these are the details need to be worked out. We need to get complete uh, uh, details on exactly where the nukes are stored, where the nuclear weapons programs are being carried out, where the research has been done, where the missile sites are. We know a lot of them from satellite surveillance, but we want the uh, Pyongyang to give us the details. Uh, We know where most of the artillery um, emplacements are as well. But what's going to happen here is is this, I think. Uh, We're going to see a gradual relaxation of tensions uh, on the Korean Peninsula. We're going to see movements toward a a peace treaty between the United States and North Korea. Um, Of course, the the U.S. was the the country that led the U.N. coalition of 18 nations during the uh, the uh, Korean War, 18 nations aside from the U.S. had uh, had troops in uh, on the Korean Peninsula, small sure. contingents for the most part. Uh, we're going to see a gradual pullback, I think, of military forces on both sides of the DMZ. The uh, the North Koreans have a million man army uh, just a few miles north of the DMZ, uh, poised in in uh, forward deployed positions for an invasion of the South. They have to pull back. It'd be good to see them demobilize. They can't really afford a million man army. Some of those army units uh, are actually uh, sent by their commanders to forage in the fields of local villagers to to get enough food to feed the army. Uh, now, of course, that leaves the villagers to starve because their crops are being stolen by uh, by these uh, by these army units. And then, of course, the the same thing would happen on the southern side of the DMZ where we would pull back. Um, that would have to happen, you know, uh, on a mutually agreed timetable. I would like to see eventually, uh, you know, uh, trade uh, open up between the two Koreas. Uh, that is would be enormously destabilizing for the North, by the way, which would be a good thing because the more uh, the North Koreans are exposed to how well the South Koreans live and what a high standard of living they've achieved. Uh, the, the more dissatisfied they're going to be with the, the, the regime that has left them uh, one of the poorest countries in the world over the last 50 years. So uh, openness serves the purposes of, uh, of, uh, of, of movement towards respect for human rights and, and democracy in North Korea. It doesn't harm us because we're an open society to begin with, but, uh, but societies that are closed uh, cannot stand the light of day. Uh, these dictatorships, this brutality flourishes in darkness and it withers in the light of day. So the more light we can shine on uh, on uh, and give to the people of North Korea, I think the, the sooner we will see change there. I wouldn't be surprised if if um, if the regime collapsed, not not this year or next year, but but within a decade, if we saw uh, North Korea truly open up. Yeah, and that would be a welcome course of events for certain. Well, Stephen, where do we find your work? Where's the best place to read your latest articles? 
Well, I write for Fox News. I write for Breitbart, uh, if people are aware of that news service. Uh, in fact, I've just got a new article coming out on uh, on Breitbart today about the uh, the denuking of North Korea by uh, by President Trump. Um, and of course, I've written a book called Bully of Asia, Why China's Dream is the New Threat to World Order. Mm-hmm. And China's dream, of course, is a dream of world domination, a fundamental change to the existing world order in a way that we and our children and grandchildren would not uh, would not welcome. And that's that book is available uh, on Amazon, of course, and and also from uh, from my own institute, the Population Research Institute. Uh, on our website at pop.org, pop.org. All right, excellent. We'll have a link uh, to those sites in the show notes to this interview. Check out financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for a free newsletter. Hey, send us emails, kl at kerrylutz.com. The Twitter feed's at kerrylutz and the Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Hey, Stephen, it's great talking to you again, and we'll look forward to getting an update from you shortly to find out what's really happening. I look forward to it. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. He did it in uh, in, in three easy moves. He first, first he got Kim Jong-un's attention. Uh, second, he put him in a sanctions box, a penalty box, and for the first time imposed real sanctions on the North Korean regime. And third, in a uh, in a meeting in Singapore, the summit, uh, that was a principles-only meeting between Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump. And they cut the spoiler, uh, two spoilers, in fact. They cut Russia and China out of the picture. And so it was... Uh, it was Kim and Trump one on one, and I think, um, and and Trump uh, Trump won. Remember back in uh, last year, we had a war of words going on between Trump and mm-hmm. Kim, and a lot of people were a little upset about that because uh, uh, it, President Trump was 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 being, they said, unpresidential. He was being undiplomatic. He was. He was calling Kim Jong Un little rocket man and and saying that he would uh, visit fire and fury on North Korea if they continue to threaten the United States. Uh, but I believe that uh, that that blunt talk was exactly what uh, little rocket man needed to hear. Remember, this guy is a princeling, right, of a hereditary dynasty, founded by his grandfather Kim Il Sung, mm-hmm. and the princeling Kim Jong Un was coddled and cosseted and babied from birth. He was fawned over by everybody he met. He was elevated, of course, upon the death of his father, uh, Kim Jong-il. And he's since been treated, he's treated in North Korea as a virtual deity. In fact, the state-controlled press actually refers to him as a great person born of heaven. (laughs) A great person born of heaven. Now, that's pretty heady stuff for a 34-year-old dictator, right? To be told that you are heaven sent. You are are a gift from, from God, from heaven. Yeah. yeah. Well, if we got gifts like that, but that he convinced uh, the North Korean dictator that he was uh, thinking about a military strike. Uh, he was he had put China helplessly on the sidelines, and and that led Kim Jong Un to agree to talk about giving up his nuclear weapons. So we had the Secretary of State Mike Pompeo go to Pyongyang, uh, the trip that paved the way for last week's Singapore summit. And, and and the other thing he did finally at the summit, step three, was uh, it, he met one-on-one with Kim Jong-un, and he took his measure, and he clinched the deal. It took him about an hour in that one-on-one meeting, which is kind of amazing given that the uh, there had been what we call six-party talks going on oh, with for North years. Korea for over a decade. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had China at the table, Russia at the table, Japan, South Korea. So many people sitting around the table that nothing got done. You know, I mean, the larger the committee, uh, the, yeah. the, the smaller the uh, the amount of work that actually gets done. So I think the the combination of the tough talk and the mm-hmm. tough sanctions and uh, Trump's gut instinct, uh, you know, in a one on one uh, situation, was able to bring Trump, uh, uh, Kim Jong Un, to the point where. Uh, he's going to give up his nukes. Um, you know, I mean, what what do you want to call that? Uh, you can call it Bronx diplomacy. Well, uh, but it worked. Yeah, maybe. it brought uh, Kim Jong Un to heel, where 
where diplomatic niceties for decades had done nothing but give him more time to build more nukes and more missiles. So what about the criticism uh, from both people within his party, within the Republican Party and the Democratic Party? Oh, you gave up war games before you got anything out of them. This is terrible. How could you do such a thing? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm a little nervous about putting uh, the, the joint military exercises between uh, South Korean and, and American military troops uh, on hold for very long because, look, the, we're rotating troops in and out of South Korea now. Uh, uh, North Korea's lifeline uh, is China. North Korea's defender, North Korea's only ally is the People's Republic of China. So you can't talk about North Korea without uh, mentioning Big Brother China. Well, so the fact is that North Korea has been a Chinese protectorate for centuries. And of course, anything that happens in North Korea is at the sufferance or desire of China. Isn't, isn't that true? Uh, China has an enormous amount of influence over North Korea. And in fact, this goes back, uh, this goes back 1,500 years. North Korea, uh, Korea itself, in fact, was part of China, ruled directly from the Chinese capital. Uh, during several periods in Chinese history. And at other times, uh, as now, it has been a vassal state, a uh, tributary state of China. And, uh, you know, 90% of uh, North Korea's trade, even today, is with China. So if you want to uh, bring North Korea to the negotiating table by imposing sanctions on North Korea to, have to shut down North Korean economy and to cause pain to the leadership, uh, Kim Jong-un and the elite in Pyongyang. Uh, the road to do that leads through Beijing. So, uh, yeah, uh, Beijing is key to uh, any discussion of, uh, of North Korea. So what happened here to enable Trump to have this apparently diplomatic victory <laughs> in the face of Chinese opposition? Is North Korea... Is uh, Kim Jong-un asserting himself or did they say, OK, did the U.S. promise China something? What's what's in it here? What's the real story? Well, here's 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 how um, uh, President Donald J. Trump denuked uh, North Korea in three easy moves. I, I think we're on the way to denuclearization. I now. agree. Uh, I really do. And, and, you know, the guy's been a bad actor for quite some time. It looks like it. It really fed into Chinese ambitions and wishes, and somehow he just seems to have outlived his usefulness. Is that what's happened? Well, what happened was that Kim got the message, uh, and of course that message was driven home by the sight of uh, three carrier battle groups and maneuvers off the North Korean coast. And um, so I think that, that Trump's tough talk was uh, succeeded in, in concentrating Kim's mind. And the second thing that Trump did was he walled off North Korea from world trade. Last November, he declared the regime to be a state sponsor of terrorism. Uh, a month later, he convinced the UN Security Council to impose sanctions on Pyongyang. But more importantly than that, that, that was actually the easy part. The hard part was getting China to abide by the sanctions regime. And, and, and I don't, uh, people should recall that, uh, that Trump had to repeatedly call out Xi Jinping on Twitter as he as he does, um, because once the sanctions were in place, the uh, the traffic across the North Korean border with China actually began to pick up. And Trump said uh, trade between China and North Korea grew almost 40 uh, percent last year in the first quarter. So so much for China working with us, he said we had to give it a try. And then later on in the year, we actually caught Chinese ships uh, doing at sea fuel transfers and good transfers with North mm -hmm. Korean vessels. So they were trying to evade the sanctions machine by m regime by carrying out their, their secret resupply of North Korea uh, by sea. They'd failed it by land and that, now they were trying it by sea. And he caught them again and he called them out on it. Uh, so by, um, by the end of the year, China had finally been embarrassed enough to actually stop with the secret support of the North Korean regime, as far as we're able to tell. So mm -hmm. what, what he'd done is he'd put North Korea in a box. So I think... FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. 
Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz. It's June 18th, 2018. Well, been watching North Korea, watching Trump. Lots of interesting things happening there. Is it smoke and mirrors? Is it real? Well, before we get to that, as always, join the show. Email us. Again, the email address is kl at kerrylutz.com. So we're looking at what's happening in Asia, what's happening with China, what their intentions are. And the person you're about to hear from, Stephen Mosier, is author of a really interesting book that kind of, uh, kind of explains a lot called The Bully of Asia. Uh, Stephen, you've been uh, covering China literally on the ground since 1979. So you're somebody who knows what's, what you're talking about. And you believe that Trump may end the l longest running war in American history, despite the efforts of China to sabotage the talk. So first, welcome back again. And we're really happy to have you back on. Well, it's, it's good to be here. I have been following China and Asia for a long time. I was an officer in the 7th Fleet back in the 1970s, resigned my commission, went to the Chinese University of Hong Kong, learned to speak, read, and write Chinese, and was the first American in China uh, back in 1979, written a dozen books on the country, and, of course, have been following uh, the uh, shenanigans of, uh, of North Korea for the last few years. Um, and, of course, if you, if you talk about North Korea, you've got to talk about China because 